So, in the Kramer Rao bond, we ended up seeing this term, right? The partial derivative of your log of your PDF function. And now you see that this actually governs, this denominator actually governs how small your lower bond can be, right? So, because of that it has been given a special name and it has also special interpretation. The it is called information number or it is called Fisher information of your sample. And naturally, if this information number is going to be larger, the lower bound in your Kramer rounds Rouse bound is going to be small. And uh, it in a way also says that if your variance is going to be small. So, if the estimator is such that its variance is going to be small, what does that mean? Louder? Data is? Huh? It is the best estimator that is fine, but uh, in what sense? It is able to essentially capture the information in the data about your parameter well, right? Data is? It could be yeah, less spreaded off for because of which PDF itself, if the data is less spreaded off or the data is not going to be spread out too much, that is when it will concentrate about its uh, variance part. But now, if you are some, if you are uh, by the way, notice that this quantity here it does not depend on the estimator, it is it is only about your PDF function, okay? So then in a way what you people are right, like it is not about estimator irrespective of what is your estimator, what matters is how good my data is spread out, like how far my data is spread out. So it is a property of only your PDF function and if your PDF is such that the data is spread out too much, will this be larger or smaller? If your data is spread out, what do you expect? Your Any estimator is going to do a good job or bad job? Bad job. In that case, what do you expect this quantity to be? Lower, right? Because the Kramer bound says that it is coming in the denominator, that means it is going to say any estimator has to incur a large variance. But on the other hand, if your data is not so spread out, it is easier to infer the parameter, maybe then it must be the case that this quantity is going to be larger for that. Okay, that is why sometimes because of the appearance of this quantity, in the lower bound in Kramer's row bound, it is also called Kramer row bound is also called information inequality. Okay. So, in the tutorial, you will see like how to compute this lower bound for various PDF functions and all. So, specific examples we will see in the tutorial, but any question about the general steps one has to follow in computing mean square estimator. Or, Kramer, or this Fisher information or the Kramer or lower bond. If you have any question, you should ask now. This one? Huh? Why not? We could use, right? So, here. I forgot to plot this, I mean I did not plot this, but if you people read the book, you can plot. Let us say you have this mean square estimators as a function of n, n is on the x axis and let us say mean squared error on the y axis and this could be for uh, both I am going to w and w prime I will plot. It may happen that.
by the way both of them the mean squared error are going to fall with as n increases right so let's say for w this is the top one is w let's say it is going to fall like this and for w prime it may happen that initially it may be larger but as n goes it may start falling faster than this at some point let's call that point as n prime so for n small n smaller than n prime which one you feel is better the second one right sorry this one let's call this as w and uh, and let's call this as a w prime so you see that for n in this region when n is small your w is better actually and it may happen that as n increases beyond n prime your w prime may be better yeah but depending on how many samples you have you can decide whether the biased one is good or unbiased is going going to be better uh so of course this is a, this is the mean square error is not going to fall down to zero but this is just like i mean this is just for representative purposes okay but i hope you got the picture and this is where the analysis is important when you have to you have data and uh, depending on your samples you need to decide which variance is going to work out better for me maybe you need to compute all this mean squared errors of your various estimators you can think of and it may end up that uh, you may want to you may end up using bi unbiased estimators because for that many samples maybe bias estimator will work out better okay so it is not necessary that uh, all the time unbiased estimators are going to do a good job okay maybe bias estimator can also do a good job but that depends yes that's why it is important to compute all this expression maybe for a some toy examples like first you need to see okay your data is discrete maybe if it's a discrete and you feel that it looks close to binomial compute all these things for the binomial and if you feel that okay your data is looking more gaussian and then compute all this for gaussian okay and by the way notice that this is you can compute this expression is true this expression is true independent of what is your underlying distribution agree this is also true irrespective of what is your underlying distribution maybe you need some property here to calculate the variance of your variance samples variance estimator okay so that is where you need to see which distributions you should use to make this computations okay so maybe what i have written here this is this holds for the gaussian distribution not necessarily for everything this this holds for every distribution but uh, this to compute variance of your variance estimator that's not easy that maybe you will be able to compute only for specific distributions like gaussian or maybe simpler ones okay so depending on your data is better representation your data is closer to the gaussian or better represented by exponential maybe you should use that particular distribution put it plug and see what is the better works out for you okay any other question on this okay if not yeah you will see the examples on this in the tutorial so let's now move on to our next topic called hypothesis testing so how many of you heard this uh, topic before yes or no okay now the same question we are talking asking about the parameters right we are estimating the parameter we could ask in a different way we can ask 
whether the parameter, the data that I am seeing, whether it is going to represent this population parameter or not. I can ask kind of S-no questions. Okay, earlier I was exactly trying to find out what is the parameter, but here I could uh, just say, okay, maybe S yes or no, or maybe it belongs to there, here or there, maybe these kind of things. And so I will make hypothesis like that, okay, S yes hypothesis is this, no hypothesis is this. Now it boils down to checking those hypotheses. Okay. So the definition is, a hypothesis is a statement about a population parameter. We, the hypothesis can be okay, the parameter lies in this range or that range. This is like hypothesis. Now you decide whether it lies in this range or that range. Come up with a criteria to evaluate that. Most of the time, we go with two hypotheses in hypothesis testing, which are complementary to each other. And the two complementary hypotheses in hypothesis testing are called null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis and they are often denoted as H0 and H1 respectively. And here the general form of the hypothesis testing is you will assume that maybe you will make a let us say this is your parameter theta space you have partitioned into two parts. Let us call the upper part as theta 0 and the lower part as theta 0 complement. You do not care which is that particular point it belongs to. What you care is whether my theta belongs to this or this. You have only two hypotheses here. My theta belongs to this region or this region. And you need to find out or come up with a method to evaluate that. Okay? And uh, if you take a real line, my hypothesis could be as simple as maybe you put some threshold here, some this is your known threshold and you ask the question whether my parameter lies in this region or in this region. This is like a boundary. Okay. Now, hypothesis need to be tested. Okay, you have two hypotheses. I said null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis in which you are, they need to be tested. And now, that hypothesis testing procedure or a hypothesis test is a rule that prescribes for which sample values the decision is made to accept your null hypothesis to be true and for which sample values H0 is rejected and H1 is accepted as true. Naturally, in this case, since there are only two hypotheses to be tested, when I reject hypothesis, null hypothesis that indicate that I am accepting alternate hypothesis. So now, the previous diagram, I showed one as the parameter space. Now let us say this is my sample space and I have only two samples and this. And maybe there is some partition here. I need to come up with the decision rule like this. Maybe something which says that all the points which are here, they correspond to let us say null hypothesis. I have come up with a decision boundary here saying that if my points belongs to in this region, I am going to accept it as null hypothesis and if it is coming from any of this space, I am going to accept alternate hypothesis or basically reject my null hypothesis. Now the question is how to come up with the decision boundary. How, who is going to give me the decision boundary? Okay. So, for that, we need to come up with a method. Okay. So, the method to come up for this decision boundary, decision boundary, we are going to use something called 
likelihood ratio test. So all of you already know what is the likelihood function. Now we are going to use it to define likelihood ratio test and using this likelihood ratio test we will define our decision rules. Okay. Now if you have given two hypotheses H0 which says my parameter belongs to the space theta 0 and H1 which says my parameter belongs to the complement of that set. Now for any random sample x, we are going to take ratio of these two quantities where the numerator is going to compute the likelihood fun maximize the likelihood function over your space of null hypothesis and the denominator is maximizing it over all possible parameters. This is both over null and alternate space. This is all possible parameters. So now let us go back and recall what we said about our likelihood functions, right? So likelihood function is capturing how likely that value theta is for my observed samples. So the numerator is trying to compute the best theta that is explaining my observed sample x. And the denominator is capturing all possible theta that is among all possible theta which is explaining my x best. Now just think intuitively, if this lambda x happens to be large, what do you expect? There, that means the numerator is dominating, right? If la lambda x is larger, that means some parameter theta in my null hypothesis is better explaining what is x. And if this quantity happens to be small, that means denominator is dominating. That means a parameter which is not in my null hypothesis is better explaining my data. Okay. So hypothetically, let us say if lambda x is going to be large, you want to accept it as a null hypothesis or a alternate hypothesis, null hypothesis, right? But then the question comes, what is this large? Okay. So for that, we are going to define a parameter. So then a likelihood ratio test is any test that has a rejection regions of the form. X lambda X is less than or equals to C. So C is some parameter that you are going to decide. So what is this is going to do is all the point for which this lambda of x is going to be less than or equals to x, it says reject. That means they are not coming from my null hypothesis, they are coming from my alternate hypothesis. And this is my rejection region. Okay. Okay, example. I forgot, right? Can you think of an example which we can work now? Just take simple case now. Let us take Bernoulli. My x is Bernoulli, x1, x2 to xn and xi are Bernoulli with parameter p. What is the likelihood function for Bernoulli? Okay, p to the power 1 minus p to the power. Let us take it the log likelihood function, right? That is simpler. Let us take the log of it. We know that nothing changes, right? Because we are optimizing. That is the changes. 
we are not looking for the argument right we are looking for the actual values here but uh, for computing the optimal value that is fine let us find let's take the log of this and uh, what are my okay now let's define okay first let me finish this xi minus n my uh, that is what log p log p and n minus summation xi log 1 minus p now let's propose me a hypothesis what should be our hypothesis i am going to check a hypothesis whether these tosses are coming from a fair coin or not so what should be my high p high my null hypothesis p equals to half and what is h1 is going to be p not equals to half okay now in this is my theta set my theta not set here is this just to have one point and what is my theta zero complement has it is like all x belonging to 0 1 and that x is not equals to half it has every other point in it okay now let's do the optimization first let's consider the numerator where uh, so log like lambda of x is what sup power p equals to p belongs to theta 0 let me write it like this l of x given p divided by sup power p belonging to entire thing 0 1 now okay that includes half and the entire thing and l x given p okay now let us compute let us uh, I know that the maximum value it does not change with respect to so what is the maximum value here first numerator theta is what half I am going to compute it at p equals to half there is nothing to optimize only one point is there so the numerator is going to be what okay let me directly put half of summation x i half of summation x i okay and what is the optimizer here I know that if I have to optimize it my p is going to be 1 by n summation x i right that we already noticed everybody agree with this the optimal value of this so the denominator is going to be summation x i by n summation x i yeah p, p I am replacing by this quantity and summation x i 1 minus n divided by n minus summation x i so what is the numerator numerator is going to be simply 1 upon n and what is denominator is that anything I can simplify in the denominator nothing you just keep it like this xi and yeah 1 minus summation xi by n and n minus xi now what you are going to do is now if you want to if a point x is given to you a point x is given to you now you are going to come up with your rejection region lambda of x is this now you are going to see if this is going to be less than or equals to c for a given c if this is the case you are going to reject it you are going to say this is not coming from your fair coin and you are going to say other way on the other hand if lambda x happens to be larger then you are going to accept it to be coming from a fair so all depends on this c how you are going to set okay so we will continue discussing this in the next class